Star passes are an integral and exciting part of roller derby. They keep the play dynamic and give the teams opportunity to increase their offensive opportunity, stem the bleeding from a defensive setback, or even allow a jammer with a skate malfunction to keep their team from suffering a two-minute power jam. But for referees, they can be the stuff of nightmares. This presentation is going to be broken down into two parts. The first will be ways of handling the star pass, some of the problems referees have, and hopefully some of the coping mechanisms for the modern game. The second will deal with the penalties and possible penalty scenarios. Star passes are something that needs to be addressed from a team perspective. It's not just the JAMA referee issue. We all need to be ready to help them out. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The original date of this recording was March 8, 2015. Major updates were made in January and February 2017 to accommodate the 2017 WFTDA rules release. Let's start with the by-the-book scenario on how a star pass happens. We can start muddying the waters later. Simply put, the jammer takes off their helmet cover and hands it to the pivot. For a brief moment, both the jammer and pivot are holding the cover, and once the jammer releases the cover, poof! The original jammer is now a blocker, and the former pivot is now an inactive jammer. Some prerequisites for the star pass are both the jammer and pivot must be in the engagement zone, both the jammer and pivot must not be down, in the derby sense of the word, and must not be out of bounds. Once the transfer has occurred, they can be any of those things, just like any other player within the normal legal boundaries. So, on the whole, pretty simple. Really, really simple for those of us who remember some older rule sets, but we shall not speak of those dark days, except for when we have to speak of those dark days. But we do have our own crosses to bear even when the rule itself is simpler. And for that, I only need to speak two words. Star stash. For those who are unfamiliar with the star stash, you could say it's a trick play, like the pump fake in basketball, or perhaps a closer analogy, if you're familiar with American football, is running the option. In this case, the jammer removes the cover from her helmet, but instead of passing it, draws the opposing team into focusing not just on her as the jammer, but also on the pivot in order to block that star pass. This, if done right, opens up additional holes for the jammer who can exit the engagement zone. So instead of passing the star, she just stashes it in her hand. Of course, she always has the option of actually passing it, similar to the option play, which means we now have to carefully watch a very small piece of cloth, lest we miss the transition or get faked out, just like the other blockers on the track. So, I have mixed feelings on this. On one hand, I want to say that if you try to fool people, you run the risk of fooling the officials too. On the other hand, I hate making mistakes, and that's just what happened if I lose the actual jammer. Not only do I feel bad for myself, but I feel like I've let the skaters down for doing what is a legal tactic. Ultimately, I can't blame the skater. The star stash has become a staple of modern roller derby because it is so effective. Have I been fooled by this? Yes, I have. And I've seen others get fooled by this too. Screw-ups happen to everyone. We're human. It happens. 
And since I've had it happen to me, I've spent a good deal of time thinking about ways to help myself not get fooled again when I'm the jammer referee and how to help other jammer referees in similar situations. But Star Stash is notwithstanding, there are other possible pitfalls for the intrepid jammer referee that may cause us to miss a star pass. For instance, small jammer, big blockers. One of the arguments against checking in women's hockey is that there can be too much of a size difference between players. Roller Derby blows that argument out of the water. But when it comes to star passes, a smaller jammer can easily get surrounded by larger blockers and prevent you from seeing the cover transfer. Jammers on the outside. Even an average or a tall jammer can be difficult to spot when on the outside of the track. And finally, it can also be easy to lose the jammer cover, especially if it ends up being wadded up in a little ball inside the jammer's hand. I seriously doubt this is intentional. I'm sure it's just the understandable desire to not lose that cover that does this, but it doesn't make us it any easier for us jam refs either. We'll cover this particular scenario and its legalities a little bit later. In all of these cases, the best way to help the jammer referee is by passing along additional information both to and from the pack refs, both inside and outside. I've yet to find anything foolproof, but here's what I'm doing. Feel free to try it out, and if you like it, use it. If you don't like it, don't use it. If you find something better, don't just tell me, tell everyone. If I'm the jam ref, as soon as I see the star cover come off, I tell the pack refs. Okay? I'm also telling myself to keep focus, but primarily it's to the pack refs. So if they see something that contradicts me, I get told about it. But it starts with jammer cover is off, followed by intermittent announcements of jammer still has the cover. You see where I'm going? If I say jammer still has the cover and a pack ref sees otherwise, I can be directed immediately over to the pivot who is now the jammer. If I'm an inside pack ref and I see the helmet cover go off, I say much the same thing to start with. Jammer cover off. Maybe add possible star pass. I don't say a whole lot after that until I see the actual jammer change. At that point, I frequently say pass complete, and I can then see if the jam ref has it in hand or if I need to move to the next step, which is to tell the jam ref your jammer is that way. If I'm an outside pack ref, I do much the same, except louder and usually with fewer syllables. If the pass happens on the outside of the track, I will yell out to the jam ref, pass complete, or just complete. If the jam ref doesn't catch it and you can't get their intention, work on an inside pack ref or just go inside. It's probably worth addressing that some of you may be concerned that the other team, who may not have been aware of the star pass, could now become aware of it. It's a valid concern, but I think this is necessary for two reasons. First, referee-to-referee -referee communication involves game information all the time. Take the front inside pack ref, telling the jammer referee that the jammer or any blockers engaging the jammer are in play. The in, 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 out. It's necessary information for us to do our jobs correctly, and this is no different. And that's really the second reason, too. We need this to do our jobs correctly. Maybe someone will come up with a better way to get this information out to those who need it. But until then, I've seen too many people, competent, good referees, miss the pass. Until then, I'm a fan of over-communicating. We cannot ask jammers to get larger or only pass the star in front of us. That would be silly and antithetical to the game. So we have to adapt. We have to communicate, help each other out, and sometimes we have to admit that mistakes happen and try to do better next time. Let's look at some possible hiccups from the skater side of things that can happen during a star pass and how we need to deal with them. First, let's look at the dropped star. So the jammer takes off her helmet cover 
and becomes an inactive jammer, but still a jammer, and then drops the cover while trying to pass it. This should be treated exactly like if the cover popped off the jammer's helmet, which means the cover can be recovered by either the jammer or the pivot. If the jammer picks it up, no big deal, we're back where we were. But if the pivot picks it up, we need to watch for several things. One, does the pivot put the cover on her helmet? If so, the pivot has initiated an illegal star pass and earns the illegal procedure penalty. Two, it's become very common for pivots who take a legal star pass to not put on the cover until after they exit the engagement zone, especially if they were on their initial pass. In this scenario, however, the pivot is still the pivot, and if so, the front inside pack ref needs to issue an out of play warning, followed by a failure to return if she does not comply. In both of these two scenarios, the burden could be on the inside pack refs because the jammer, and by definition the jammer referee, could be at a totally different area of the track. It's also the responsibility of the inside pack refs in the event of a penalty to alert the penalty box staff that the incoming skater is a blocker and not a jammer. The third possible option is the pivot could bring the cover back to the jammer, who, if she takes it, can keep the cover or immediately hand it back to the pivot for a successful star pass. There is a fourth scenario. The pivot could hold onto that cover for the remainder of the jam. As long as she doesn't do anything illegal, such as putting it on or picks up an out of play penalty, there's nothing illegal about picking up a fallen cover and holding on to it indefinitely. The next scenario is similar, which is the jammer throws the helmet cover. I've seen several occasions where pivots actively avoid the thrown cover like it's the plague. In fact, it's not. They can grab the cover, but just not put it on. Like with the dropped cover, it's not a completed star pass. The pivot can grab that cover midair and hand it back to the jammer for that jammer to either return to active jammer status or for a legal star pass. However, if a blocker grabs that cover midair, or like in the first scenario, a dropped or fallen cover, that is an illegal star pass initiated by that blocker because only pivots and jammers can be involved in star passes and only pivots and jammers can recover fallen, dropped, or thrown helmet covers. Further, pivots can also throw that jammer helmet cover back to the jammer. The next possible issue involves where either the jammer or pivot are down, out of bounds, or out of play. In these scenarios, we have an illegal star pass to be given to the jammer as the initiator, assuming there's no other extenuating circumstances. In the olden days, when the star pass wasn't complete until the pivot actually donned the cover, it was possible that the jammer would commit a penalty before the pivot made the pass complete, and we could issue an additional warning, color number, you are not the jammer and you are out of play. Most of the time, a pivot should know if a pass is legal or not, but in the case of something like this, where perhaps the call is delayed or the pivot is just really, really fast, the pivot may assume that the pass is complete and telling them that they are not the jammer or what we sometimes call the fancy pivot is something we should have in our pockets for these types of situations. Regarding hidden helmet covers, the rules now say that hiding them is illegal. But before you start calling every jammer who holds onto the cover with a full fist for a penalty, I think it wise to think that there are two different kinds of ways to hide helmet covers. The first is intentional. Down the jersey, in a pocket, or wadded up and packed away like it was a musket ball. The second is not so much intentional. Maybe a, a little bit of the cover is showing and it's hard to track. Trust me, I sympathize on this. So I'm asking you to think about the skater for a moment. If there's one piece of equipment that's more important than any other on their team, it's the jammer star. They can't score points without it. And if they have no points, there's no way to win. And even if a team is in total defensive mode, often the best way for a team to stop bleeding points is to get their jammer out into scoring position 
to force the other jammer to call it off. So it's in their own interest to not lose that cover under any circumstances. Thus, a full-fisted grab with maybe only an inch or two of fabric showing could be reasonable. So if you don't think it's an intentional hide, but it's still becoming an undue burden for the jammer referee to track, I would highly recommend that the head referee talk to the teams and issue a warning. Give them a chance to change their grip, as it were, rather than just popping off jammers to the penalty box. Take this opportunity to be a good guy. It comes along so rarely when you wear stripes. A couple quick scenarios where everything could look legal but isn't, and they involve the penalty box. Jammers on their way to the penalty box cannot pass the star, nor can they pass the star to a pivot who is in queue for the penalty box. Pack refs, be sure to alert the jammer referee if the jammer takes off the star when there's a pivot in queue for the box. With the 2017 rules release, there was a lot more discretion on what referees could decide was major impact. They did this without writing down every little event because tactics change. And I think we all were a little tired of people trying to look for loopholes. The good news is that for those who officiated under the old rules, not much has changed, including what I'm about to talk to you about, which is what we used to call star pass interference. Hopefully this idea is pretty simple. 99% of the time, if a jammer gets lightly back blocked, for example, and I mean lightly as in it doesn't cause a stumble or lost position, maybe sent backwards a few inches or half a foot, we'd call this a no impact back block. The block was illegal, but it lacked the impact necessary to be considered a penalty. Now, let's do that same minor impact back block, but the jammer was about to pass the star. The star was in the jammer's hands and was a few inches from the pivot's outstretched hands, and that block pushed it away. That back block caused major impact. It prevented a legal star pass and thwarted a legal and often effective strategy. Even though this is not explicitly written into the rules and casebook, this is the kind of critical thinking and evaluation that the WFTDA Rules Committee wants referees to use. It doesn't have to be a back block either. The jammer's arm could be swatted away by an opponent, a low block changing the jammer's trajectory, whatever. The rules are inviting you to think about how these illegal actions affect the game above and beyond the traditional impact spectrum. Likewise, you need to judge specifically with a star pass, is the star pass actually feasible? Don't issue a penalty for this if the pivot has no reasonable chance of getting the star. Even back when star passes were really evil to referees, evil enough that they made baby deities cry, I, as a fan of roller derby, didn't want to see them go away. I was very happy when the rules were simplified. I was able to step off one of my soapboxes. But clearly, they aren't easy yet. And short of getting rid of them, I don't see that happening anytime soon. And honestly, as much as I hate to relive my mistakes with star passes, they add a layer of excitement and strategy to the game that we'd be poorer for not having any longer. And seriously, every sport uses chess as an analogy to their game. But how many can actually say that they can perform the castling move in the middle of play? I'd like to thank Donna Olmsted and Doff Lensgren for permission to use their photographs for this presentation. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site but please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.